Uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Gary Nabel, the Chief Scientific Officer and Global Research and Development um, Head of North America. Uh, Chief Scientific Officer, Global Research and Development, and Head of North America Research and Development at Santa Fe. Tracy Brown, the CEO of the American Diabetes Association. Dr. David Scorton, President and CEO of the Association of the American Medical Colleges, or the AAMC. Dr. Gary Gibbons, Director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH. And I think you likely know our moderator, Steve Clemens, uh, from his work at The Atlantic or from reading The Washington Note. And Steve is now with The Hill as their editor at large. Take it away. Mary, thank Steve. you very much. And Mike Castle, Mary, your team, congratulations on uh, you know, getting everybody who cares about science into one room. Uh, in Washington, no, but hopefully it's it's much better. You know, I've, I we're going to have you know. Imagine you know, I'm, I met many of you watched the View, but don't want to admit it. Uh, and so imagine this is going to be a chatty, conversational discussion on science and what's coming. I know that's impossible to imagine, but 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 this is going to be the View version of what's coming in science. And our our title is Then, Now, and Imagine, and and so it has this sort of uplifting notion. But I watched a bunch of Quentin Tarantino films uh, last week and and what's interesting is you know there's always some shades of gray and who are the villains and who are the heroes uh, and so I want to start out I'm going to ask you the Gary Gary on my far left uh, to start off you know as you think about where we've been what we're doing what we're thinking about you know to a certain degree the promise of science and technological advancement you know and and you know in, in, in Michael's area taking you know molecules to market or with what Gary is doing as well I'm interested in the sort of ecosystem of the operation and who, as we look back, would you identify who or what are the villains in this story? We're storytellers. I want to know who you, from your perspective, and don't hold back. <laughs> the villains. Oh my gosh. Um, so from where I sit at NIH, um, I'll take some responsibility that uh, I wouldn't call the government a villain, uh, since I am a federal employee. How many think the government is a villain? No, no, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Gary. Uh, but I'd like to look at it more positively that uh, my institute was started 70 years ago uh, at the height of the coronary heart disease epidemic in the mm. last century. Uh, and that's where it was instituted, the National Heart Institute, uh, to address a public health scourge of the time. Uh, productive individuals were dying in middle age mm. uh, and that uh, was devastating to our country. Uh, I believe the Institute played a, a, a critical catalytic role in understanding what is driving this coronary heart disease epidemic uh, and with the Framingham Heart Studies and others defined risk factors, defined the ideologic pathways and that really took uh, an ecosystem to really bring to fruition. You had to have population scientists to define that, uh, but then you needed uh, some uh, brilliant molecular geneticists like uh, Brown and Goldstein uh, to look at families and look at little girls who were having uh, blockages of their heart disease and needed a cabbage mm. uh, to survive and find out what are the genetic determinants of an abnormality in cholesterol, that metabolism, that then identified targets that uh, were, are the targets today of statins. Uh, that couldn't have been done all by the government, uh, but obviously we funded both that population science and basic. Uh, and we also, quite frankly, NHLBI contributed to the proof of concept that cholesterol is not only a risk, but lowering it might be beneficial. Uh, and then the private sector was clearly critical at driving and commercializing and scaling uh, a great therapeutic that to this day is the cornerstone of cardiovascular. And I might add that it didn't have it didn't end there. Uh, just because you got approval uh, and had efficacy, the other part was to get probably all the gray-haired people here uh, on statins, uh, such that it would have penetration and public health impact to reduce coronary heart disease deaths uh, for the country, which has gone down 70% over the last 50 years. So you need that all the elements of that ecosystem uh, to get not only that, that target and the, 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 the means, but also the dissemination and implementation and systems to make that work. 
I must say though uh, that uh, we still have a problem that uh, a year after a heart attack, um, only half the people are still taking their stat. Mm. Uh, so we clearly still have some challenges in the science of what some people call the science of delivery to ensure that a lot of these things that we know work really are able to get public health impact. Thank you. That's a very nice snapshot of kind of some of the challenges we had before and what's coming online to address them and what sort of some of the endemic uh, challenges remain. David, you're about to jump out of your seat. You want to challenge him, right? So, No, I mean, uh, I had money from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for years. I would never challenge him, ever. <laughs> but uh, I, want to, I want to change the angle just for a minute. Yeah. I want to ask, why do we have to have such a thing as Research America? Just think about that. By Why the way, it's the third, I'm sure they've said it over and over again, but congrats on your 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. So why is it that we have to come together and have advocacy in favor of something that's so obviously needed and has done such obvious good? And I think part of the reason for that is that the scientists, putting myself in that category now, have lived too much in our own ecosystem. And I want to pick up on the excellent keynote that Michael gave about vaccines. Why is it that we're fighting this anti-vax movement? You all perhaps remember, I remember like it was yesterday. You get to a certain age, you can always remember things decades ago like it was yesterday. When the article came out in The Lancet in 1998 right. that showed supposedly a correlation between autism and vaccine. Even though that article was retracted, was debunked, the person was stripped of his medical license, and so on and so forth, you can't blame the public for being confused by the scientific discovery system. So an article in one of the finest journals in the world says one thing, and then a few months later, and a year later, we say something else. For decades. So it's the media's fault. No, it's our fault. It's the scientist, it's Atlantic's fault. Um, similarly, for decades, cardiologists like, like you and I told people, you gotta be careful of fats. The issue is fats. Sugars are not so bad, fats are a big deal. Don't have an egg, you might die from the egg. Definitely don't have whole milk, that would be a disaster. And now, we say just a few years later, well, you know, actually, we rethought it, it's not such a bad thing. And what's the confusion among the public? We don't take a stand of teaching the public what the scientific discovery method is. Mm. It's not enough that we talk about our results, which are very impressive. But the public has to understand there's never a complete answer to any question. There's only the next question to be asked. And the reason we're so lucky to have Research America is that Research America plays this enormously important role, if not a unique, a very unusual role, in helping not only to talk about the goodness of the discoveries that are made, but the importance of the process. And I want to focus on process today. We need to follow lead of people like Mary Woolley to say, it's the process of discovery that we're supporting, not any particular discovery. And I think the villain is that we have not done a good enough job dealing with the media or dealing with the public directly or dealing with our patients to explain, don't get whiplash, science is one step after the other. That's why we need Research Thank America. Thank you for that. I, I, I wanted, we're gonna get on the table a lot of the amazing technological opportunities that lie ahead and how we're getting there. Michael, for those of you who haven't read this phenomenal profile, it's such a vanity piece about him, but he deserves it, um, on, <laughs> on him being a chess master uh, and how to approach these big questions strategically. But you've hit on something that's really core to me. We, the Hill recently did this Future of Healthcare Summit, and in conversation with a lot of the private sector innovators that are out there across the board in the biopharmaceutical world, you know, and I've, I've worked with Lilly, worked with Pfizer, worked with Horizon, lots of folks in that, in that game. I, I kind of challenged them and I said, I'm only hearing about your successes. And I think that brainwashes the public to think it's a one-way game to enrichment for companies. I said, why aren't you talking more about your failures or about process, which includes failures, mm -hmm. so that there's a healthier understanding of, of both process, but not every deal comes, comes, you know, comes out. And I, you know, Lilly has a, a story of a $3 billion investment in an Alzheimer's uh, drug that didn't work out. It's a very powerful and emotional film. And so I'm wondering whether we need to become more comfortable, whether you need to become more comfortable acknowledging failure after investments as rather than just, you know, punch. Gary? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Failure is part of the process. In fact, if you, you know, Michael can vouch for this equally well. If, 
if you take a product that's gone into uh, it had successful phase two trial, clinical trial, the likelihood that it will be successful in phase three is probably about 20 percent. It's going to be less than 50 percent. Depends on how good your phase two trial data is. But failure is built into the process and, and every, every decision we make is really based on, on the probability of success and, and, our, and the whole process is a process that we call de-risking. Right? We, we, don't, we don't move to the next step unless we've maximized the chances for success. So I think one of the exciting things about the future and some of the imagine ideas that you're trying to get to is that I do think we will have opportunities in the future to uh, test the waters more effectively uh, with new technologies, maybe with less upfront investment, which would allow us to test more things uh, at lower cost and increase the likelihood of success. But you're absolutely right that the, uh, you know, the reason that it costs so much to develop a drug, uh, the, the numbers vary, but you know, two billion is probably a reasonable number isn't because it takes two billion for that one drug. It's mm. you're, you're factoring in all the failures along the way. And uh, failure is very much part of the process. So uh, Tracy, before we get to some of the next big tech things on the horizon, um, digging into your past a little bit, uh, you have a very unusual past compared to the folks on the panel. Um, you were in marketing for American Express, Procter & Gamble, ExxonMobil. A lot of our other areas, you thought about how do you, t how do you deal with consumer-facing uh, products and, and build it. So now, as heading the American Diabetes Association, I'm interested in this question of a marketing challenge, right? So Research America and all of you are essentially part of this ecosystem of how do you get the equities right among all these stakeholders and keep the system moving forward. Um, so you've got advancement, but you still have people getting access. In, in, from a patient perspective, from those that are on the client end of this, what are our colleagues here not aware of enough from, from your marketing experience? Yeah, I don't know, um, Steve. I think that if you think about all that we are doing, and my lens is specifically now on the diabetes epidemic, Everything that we're doing, the research, the discoveries, the translation of the research, all is on behalf of the person living with, right? right? And the only way that you're going to actually drive change, drive action, is that you have to have a connection. There, I just read a study recently that talked about the lack of trust that people have in scientific research mm -hmm. and data. That trust goes back down to a personal level, right? That people aren't actually seeing the connection to their own value system, and therefore the trust is degraded. So I think the way that we get to this is we actually have to start to track culture, mm. right? a way to start to engage and create connection and trust is you actually have to understand culturally where people are and where the world is going. And so we've been tracking um, cultural signals uh, on a real-time basis to understand what are some key cultural signals, particularly re related to research and health outcomes. And there are a few. Um, that are bubbling to the surface right now. And if we as researchers, as healthcare practitioners, as advocate groups can figure out how to tap into these cultural trends, I think we have a accelerated chance of trying to change behavior. One of those cultural trends is just this whole movement around quantified self with the uh, proliferation of technology and wearables and everybody being able to have access to data, people are now more interested in taking control of their own data. How do we actually leverage that? Uh, how do we use um, things like augmented assets? So one of the things um, that has been unique uh, from a heart perspective and blood, pr blood pressure perspective is the trial that was done meeting people in the communities in the barbershop, mm -hmm. right? Like, 
We've got to figure out how to meet people where they are culturally in order for them to trust what we're doing and the great science. It was mentioned earlier today, findings that are sit on the shelf do no one any good. If we cannot figure out how to connect, the great work that we're doing won't get adopted. And so I think it's about trust, it's about culture, it's about creating a different value proposition for the people suffering with said diseases. Do you, just before I jump to Michael to, to give him the responsibility to fix all this, um, <laughs> you, you've said something, you know, there is a great study that the Wellcome Trust in England, UK, just put out on uh, public attitudes towards science and doctors and medicine, and it compares all the countries of the world. And interestingly, the highest degree of trust out there is, uh, uh, is in Rwanda. Rwanda is number one, and sort of makes you think that the crisis they went through, the kinds of things they went through, had created a very different set of, of um, equities there. The United States comes in at 72%, which the head of the Wellcome Trust was saying, that's a great number. And I'm like going, that's not a great number. You know, that means that somehow you have a significant enough population that does not see value. And it just raises this interesting question that we're on the verge of CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing, you know, revolutions in vaccines, um, changing the economics of rare disease research. I mean, a lot of this stuff that's, that's on the verge there. And I'm just wondering if there's been this kind of diminishing sense of value, even though the leaps that we're about to take are staggeringly huge. Well, I mean, again, if people are not seen, heard, understood, they don't think that these things are for them. And we've got to make that jump in the connection. All of the great stuff that is to come, because there is a lot of hope. Um, I see a lot of hope for the future. We've got to figure out, Steve, though, how do you do that connect, right? And Somebody said it earlier, if you see it, you can be it. If you're not fully understanding and right. being represented and seen and talked to and heard, you will believe all of this great stuff that is happening is not for me. And so everything for me goes back to how do you connect? Right. Gary, you're going to jump in yeah, before just, Michael. Uh, Steve, it, I had not seen that article, uh, but when you say Rwanda, quite frankly, from an NIH standpoint, that's one of the best partners of a low middle income country in terms of really delivering something. So right. if you look at their HIV uh, uh, control, we're, we're doing it's hypertension incredible. study yeah. control. They have, they have an incredible leader uh, there who's a woman who connects. Uh, who's able to disseminate programs that reach people no, where some they are, are. Some are actually arguing, and Pfizer is going to be involved in this with some of the mileage stuff, that, that the, uh, uh, the methodologies that, that are now on you know, deployed in Africa are operating there better than some in the United States market. So it's an interesting thing to look internationally. But Michael, let me, you know, this, this article that just came about you was wonderful. And apparently, I just want to ask you like one personal question. So, so, you know, you were brought in and you told your boss, the CEO, when you came into the position that this is going to be like a chess game, slow, incremental, strategic. Did you tell him that tennis comes after or, uh, you know, does it get better? I, I mean, I, I guess, because I like the notion of a strategic uh, attack on these questions, and I want to ask you as a strategist in this mm -hmm. ecosystem, what would be the pieces you think we need to collectively move? And, and um, tell us what you told your CEO. Well, you know, uh, I, I didn't have time to tell the other story uh, since you asked about, you know, what, is the, what things can come afterwards. When, when you play chess, uh, you always start to learn what is a long game, to do it rigorous and understand all the analytical options, to build that trust in, you know, how, does, how do you play a game. But uh, there is a fast game. A long game takes five hours. A fast mm. game takes ten minutes. Mm. And in a fast game, you're actually um, making decisions almost instantly by looking at pattern. It's almost like, you know, an image an analyzer. And once you have an organization that have trained to do a longer game, they can do image analysis just looking at patterns and know where to go, what's the, di di the direction of whether you make a compound or synthesize the vaccines or planning a clinical trial. So that's the upside. You have to work hard and build. So that's AI. That, well, that's what you do as a chess player. It was the pre-AI. And I, I think humans can work very much like a simplified version of AI by looking at pattern 
And that's how you recognize usually a painting, right? You see certain patterns that the painter has. <laughs> And that's the 10 minutes chess game rather than the five hours. And right. that's the next step for an R&D organization too, to see patterns and make quick decisions. But you, you have to you know, build the capabilities and train to get there. So in this question though of the ecosystem of people in this room, <coughs> stakeholders in this room, you know, everybody has their own story of what, what they feel needs to be pushed. They have stories about uh, whether there is even distribution in the country, who the stakeholders are. We have discussions about diversity in science. I'm interested as you look at the future of science and how we, you know, to, to, to what Tracy just said, connect with people where they're at. That's one side of the beast. The other side of the beast is, you know, keep the uh, tech flow going and keep it in a promising hit. When you look at that ecosystem, because you, you, you're also uh, facing consumers and dealing with these groups. How do you, what are the three or four things that you think are the levers that you most need to pull right now? And David, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Okay. Well, I, I think e e every ecosystem is, is almost like a living organism. It, it's very fragile, so you need always to nurture it. And it takes a long time to build and it can fall apart if you don't put in the trust and, and ability to be generous into the ecosystem when you work together. <coughs> and what is fascinating right now that I, I think across many of the major diseases, uh, like in cancer, we see opportunities to go from being incremental in the ecosystem to be really life-saving, mm -hmm. go from months to think about decades of saved patient lives. In, um, this, you mentioned rare disease and the revolution in genetics. You know, who would have dreamt that uh, someone born, unfortunately, with a faulty written genome could be cured by one single infusion of gene therapy? And that you may happen to have been given such an unfortunate start of life could be turned into uh, a miracle and promise of life. So. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen in isolation. It happens only when NIH invests in some uh, platform technologies, uh, understanding genome sequencing, and we build knowledge hubs together across many different parts of the ecosystem. And we're willing to share experiences about failures to make everyone be able to win at the higher level, rather to compete in, in you know, a, a county or district championship competing for the Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. But it only happens if you believe and foster this type of ecosystem that can propel talents to do so well. David, let me ask you the same thing with a slight twist. Thank you, uh, Michael. The, the, the question I have really is on, on what's coming down the line. And, and, and as you look at these next opportunities, you know, we can think about CRISPR, we can think about you know, gen genetic editing and, and, and you know, uh, uh, just a vast number of um, tech-related advancements that, that are strategic leaps. And I'm, I'm interested in, in what can get in the way of that future? And I asked you, because you're not only now head of the Association of Medical College, you, you ran the Smithsonian. So I'm sure you wrestled with this issue of how do you, at the same time, keep this great public good alive and thriving in a world where not everybody is, is uh, uh, addicted as you are to that. So how do we keep, you know, and, and maybe go through some of the things that you think are on the verge that could be transformative. Um, but how do you keep that that ecosystem something that, that we all value. So that people um, don't fear CRISPR, they embrace CRISPR. So they understand that data uh, is going to be transformative. And I was going to ask, we're not going to have enough time for this, does HIPAA help or hurt? I needed to ask that, you know. You know, and when you're th sharing data and looking at a lot of these things, there seem to me lots of roadblocks. And I'm interested in how you manage them. Well, we can do no better than follow up comments that Tracy made and Michael made. On Tracy's side, trust is going to come from people seeing that they're part of the game that they're actually involved in it. And it goes along with my earlier uh, comment that we need to make sure the public understands the process that we're going through. But I want to go back to Michael's uh, chess metaphor. Um, as great as the pattern recognition quick thing is, in science, we're there for the long game. Mm -hmm. And we make the mistake at our peril of making people think if you put a few bucks in a certain budget this year, something's going to happen six months later. It gives false expectations, and it doesn't actually take us where we need to be. I think our industrial colleagues will agree that a lot of the fabulous things that they're doing now were based on discoveries decades ago that I, anyway, could never have predicted. What is one basic science discovery today going to result in 30 years from now? 
So I think that we need to continue, as boring as it sounds, through Research America, to go back again and again and again and explain the process of science and say that the most seemingly abstruse discovery or process now could turn out with something 30, 40 years from now that could never have predicted going forward. And when you trace that pathway back to the original discovery, it's a mind blower that it even happened that way. So I think one thing we need to do is talk about the long game. It's very hard to do in an industrial setting when you have shareholders. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to do in a country that has a budget every year. At least we hope has a budget every year, you never know. <laughs> After living through a shutdown not too long ago at the Smithsonian, you know, it changes people's lives if there isn't a budget. Mm. But I think we need to think about the long game and think about investigator-initiated, peer-reviewed research and trust the system that in the long run, a grant from the NHLBI, peer-reviewed, based on whatever the investigator think is the next best step, is our best pathway forward, even though we can't tell you right now where that path would go. Yeah. Tracy, let me ask you, you know, you, you've made a very powerful statement about reaching people where they are. I recently moderated something on uh, cancer and clinical trials and others uh, in Minneapolis. And the focus was really communities that weren't typically participating in clinical trials. Native American communities, you know, certain African American communities, um, uh, uh, Somali and, and sort of North African communities that were there. And how you find, you know, trusted uh, players and bridges to bring this in. And I'm wondering from your perspective as we're trying to connect science to people, are there bank shots out there we're not thinking about? Hmm. You know, are there things that we can proactively do to uh, find those bridges to change the game so that your job becomes easier than it is now? Because I know, you know, folks with diabetes, and I, I know this is a personal story for you as well, uh, already in the game. But I think part of it is moving beyond people that aren't necessarily suffering from that ailment, but are also see themselves as part of the solution. And I'm interested in what the bank shots are that we may not be seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, Steve, just as you said, uh, from a diabetes perspective, you know, one out of two people are living with prediabetes or diabetes, right? So everybody either knows somebody close or mm -hmm. their neighbor or someone. So I think the proliferation of it now um, makes it a little bit more real um, for many. I think as you think about um, what it's going to take in the future, I do think we have to envision a world where we are bringing traditional systems together with new systems. And I think the new systems are actually built on community. I actually talk about community as the fourth network. If um, hospitals is the first, doctor's office is the second, urgent care centers is the third, community is the fourth. And so how do you bring traditional with, not replacing, with the new? And I think there are three lanes that you actually have to start to look at that in. One is infrastructure. Um, we talk about, again, culturally augmented assets. Are there things that are existing in the community today that we can augment where maybe people have a little bit more trust and are willing to go to, whether it be a, a rec center or a library or even fire stations, right? Like in California, they have turned fire stations into these clinics. Mm. The second lane that I think we have to think about is accessibility. How accessible mm -hmm. is all of this stuff um, that we're working on? And here's what we do know. Um, Nine times out of 10 in America, people may not have a cable, they may not have a computer, they may not have all these right. things, but they all have, for the most part, this. And so when we think about reaching in and making things accessible, I think we have to start to think through So is this where, where wearables and measurements and sensors I, come in? Do you, you know, I, I, there's a, a I always fear mentioning anyone because some of you may not like him, but there's this guy named Steve Papermaster. He used to be an advisor on science to President Bush. And, and he basically says we need to change the game by which people feel much more in control of their own data mm -hmm. so that they have an intimacy with it, an understanding of it, that they can control it. It fits within the wearable fad, if you want to call it a fad, maybe it's not a fad. But, but that may be part of changing the picture and changing their sense of power yes. in, the, in the game. I mean, right? I can talk really personally about this. So, so I've been living with diabetes for 15 years and you know, 
right, wrong, or indifferently. I was probably in denial for five of them. I decided to try and get my act together. Um, but it wasn't until, for me, that I actually started using a CGM. Hmm. And then I have all kinds of data, right? Like to tell me exactly what is happening. This has created a different um, emotion, mm -hmm. right? The emotion that has been created by me being in, conceivably, in control of what I'm doing. Everything that I eat, I just finished eating. I don't know if people can see this, but I feel pretty good about this. My blood sugar right now is 79, which is what normal non-people living with diabetes would, would have. Mm. I've only been able to get here by the unlock of real-time data mm. to tell me and show me what I'm doing, the choices that I'm making, right. how it is that affecting my body. I think wearables and this quantified, quantified life, quantified self movement is an unlock. And as researchers and uh, scientists, how do we take hold of this? I think, right. I think it's very important. I want to go to the audience next for a couple Good. of minutes, but I just want to go very fast, kind of, you know, rapid, you know, let's wrap up the view kind of thing. Um, <laughs> I want to be Jules Verne of the next uh, 30 years and steal ideas from you on what you think are the next big transformative leaps that you want to highlight to put on the table. You know, just pick one. Gary? Pick one. Uh, <laughs> so our current moonshot is to cure sickle cell uh, disease uh, and leveraging these gene editing technologies, um, but also to leapfrog it in a way where uh, we're not just doing it in the current sense of bone marrow transplant, mm -hmm. a big complicated sort of procedure, right. but one where uh, it would work in rural Georgia in a day hospital or in Accra, Ghana. Mm. Uh, and so can we take this technology, the sophisticated technology we're doing now, and make it such that it can work in either of those settings in a single shot where you can get this uh, platform to home to where it needs to go, do what it needs to do, and transform a I life. I could write a Not novel just out of that idea. Great, great, great idea. Gary, <laughs> are you have anything as good as he does? <laughs> <laughs> he always does. I agree with him completely. <laughs> I, actually, uh, I think that I, I think it's going to come. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I yeah. think it'll be fascinating to watch how it unfolds. But I, I would, uh, on, on, an, on a slightly different topic, uh, put one out there that I think is feasible and in a shorter time than most of us would think, and it falls along the line of what where Michael's heart is, which is, I think, universal flu vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we should be able to have a vaccine that you get for influenza. Just remind people how many people that, I mean, when I looked at the death rates of flu in the world, I, I was blown away. I had no idea they were as large as they continue to be. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the death rates vary from year to year. Yeah. But for example, if you go back, I think it was 2018, 2017, right. uh, we had over close to 80,000 deaths from flu that year in the United States alone. That's more deaths than all the traffic accidents in the U.S. in one year. We did, you know, flu is a silent killer. And it's usually hundreds of thousands of deaths per year worldwide, so. So you think that's coming soon? I, well, soon is all relative, but I'd say within a five-year horizon, we'll have much improved flu vaccine. Seems so long. <laughs> uh, Michael. These guys are so good, they're stealing all my ideas. Uh, I'm lucky I'm number three and not number uh, six in a row here. So, uh, you know, I, I think another example could be um, really um, aspiring high to the stars in, let's say, curing the four most common cancers. Mm. Breast, prostate, lung, and colorectal cancer. Mm. Each of them have a different type of science. Some are hormone dependent, others are sensitive to this immune oncology space and some are really prone to genetic classification and I think we are now at the stage that we are not thinking about a therapy but therapeutic combinations. Mm -hmm. So in the next three decades I hope we'll see therapeutic combinations based on huge data amounts by patients and you know you showed blood sugar, and it could be that we will read the um, information status of your immune and your pre-cancer changes by instant, maybe blood-borne tests, mm. similar to like you discussed here. So that would be my hope that we would be sitting here on a panel and 
we wouldn't look upon those four cancers with great fear. We'd be speaking about improving great mm. therapies, but not having that fear that a neighbor, a friend, or yourself would be hit by a diagnosis. Great answer. Tracy? I'm going to go, um, Steve, with I'm not giving up on finding a cure for diabetes. Um, look, we're going to showcase how we continue to thrive until we find a cure. But I think this year's um, scientific sessions from the <coughs> ADA, there was some very exciting work, um, at least I left uh, feeling extremely hopeful. One particular uh, researcher, Dr. Kenneth Brayman, identified a key component of the immune system that is different in people living with type 1 diabetes. And he has had some promising preliminary results of new therapies to restore that, which is suggesting that that would prevent or even reverse type 1 diabetes. So. I'm hanging my hat on, we're gonna actually get there. And Dr. Brayman's, his, you know, he won an innovator award in basic science. And it started in basic science, but I, I think we're gonna get there. Finally, David. I'm gonna take a little different run at it just to make it more like the view. Um, cool. <laughs> this is gonna be Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> as, as important as all this stuff we've been talking about is uh, the healthcare system deals with about 20% of what makes us healthy or not healthy. The rest are social determinants of health. Absolutely. Yeah. And I believe, and this touches on what, what Tracy said in two versions, one, um, the business about feeling enfranchised, if I can use that word, mm. and the other one mentioning the Ron Victor, the late Ron Victor's work with the barbershops is a close friend of mine for a long time, passed away tragically uh, about a year ago, give or take, year and a half. And these are social determinants of health care. And I believe that there will be research done by social scientists and others who will show us ways to think about and act on the social determinants that we know. And that also requires research. And so I think the big leap which will make the huge amount of difference is if we can get our hands dirty on these social determinants, mm. even those that are controversial, even those that separate people. Like for example, I just have to take the stage to say this, that Gun violence is an epidemic in our country. It's time we treat it like an epidemic and a public health crisis. And that's an example of a social determinant of, of, of care. And I think as long as we can do research on those things and allow people to feel that they have some control wherever they live and whatever their access is, we will make big progress. Thank you for that. I'll just say, you know, just to, to, to shine a little light on my former colleague at the Atlantic, Olga Kazan, wrote this piece about the 20-year life uh, 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 expectation discrepancies between different counties in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at infrastructure, you look at gun violence, you look at, you know, just, just areas that are near each other, you know, not, not to repeat something that's become a cliche, but those zip codes where they are really certainly matter. Uh, so I'm glad you put that on the table. So we've got time for a couple of minutes, uh, for a couple of questions here. Uh, let's jump in here. Uh, let's go to this gentleman right here. And we're going to try and go fast, so short questions, short Thank answers. You, uh, Hi, uh, Mike Friedlander, Vice President for Health Science, Virginia Tech. Uh, I'd like to follow up on what Dr. Scorton and Dr. Brown said. <clears throat> I, I think I, I first want to agree and say just educating the public on understanding the process is absolutely critical. I think to Dr. Brown's point about the cell phone, one of the things we don't do a good job of is connecting the dots for the public on discoveries, and they don't just come from the biomedical sciences. Right. Look at anything you want, imaging, computation, even social determinants of health and analytical tools. Too often we don't draw the lines for the public about how we got there, coming from very fundamental discoveries. And I think all of our agencies mm -hmm. and organizations represented here can do a good job of picking one or two of those great stories and getting them out there for the public. Thank you for that comment. So I think most, and does anybody disagree with him? No, okay, we're that cool. We and you can't uh, push him around right because over he's not here. on the panel, see? Yeah, well, I, you'd be surprised. <laughs> here we go, right here, this gentleman. Uh, do we have a mic over here? Coming your way. Applause for our mic runners. Oh, well, we'll do, we'll do this gentleman and then this gentleman. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, st stick with him and we'll, we'll make sure we include okay. this gentleman too. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rush Holt. Um, oh, hey, another, Rush. another fine, stimulating panel. Thank you all. Um, picking up on a theme. How do you, let me ask you, how do you fix Congress on this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Not my department. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, there was this theme of trust that right. ran through here. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for raising that and others. But David, you made an offhand comment that I'm wondering how we reconcile it with that. Um, you said, so you want the public to let the researchers decide what needs to be studied next. Um, doesn't that leave a sense, or how do we avoid leaving a sense with the public then that science is what scientists do for scientists and a, create a distance right. from the scientists and the general public, which then, of course, removes the support for doing the science. It makes it harder to integrate the outcome of the science uh, and so forth. Um, there is this big chasm mm. between the public and scientists. Doesn't that contribute to it if the scientists say, well, here's what we want to study next? Great, thank you. And, and we're going to go to this channel next, but uh, David and anyone who'd like to quickly respond. Well, first of all, you can't argue with Rush Holt about anything, but, but I would say um, th there, there is a tension, a healthy tension, and I think like all other healthy tensions, we have to recognize it and work with it. And I think, again, to go back to Tracy's wisdom, that if people feel that they are part of the process somehow, if we're listening to the public, if we're going to the public, I think we can somehow begin to shrink that chasm a little bit but I'm talking not only about scientists in the basic biomedical disciplines rush, but I'm also talking about those in the social sciences, communication, and all the other aspects that if we don't pay attention to them, we're not gonna, we're not gonna heal that chasm. Thank you. Uh, Gary and Gary? Yeah, it's, it's, so there's a dovetail there. Uh, first, NHLBI funded Ron Victor's study yep. in the barbershop. Yep. Uh, and so those ideas, as, as brilliant as Ron was, came out of engaging right. the communities. They knew the barbershop exactly. is where black men are and exchange wisdom about themselves. Yep. Uh, and so it's really that engaged research with the community. And it's not shocking that some of the same communities that have the highest incidence of HIV, opioid epidemic, chronic obstructive lung disease, heart disease, that are pushing the life expectancy in the wrong direction mm -hmm. are in those communities. And so I think engaging them where they are with their ideas and wisdom about what their community needs is part of that. Gary? Yeah, you know, Steve, you mentioned Rwanda earlier, and two things strike me about Rwanda, and that is that particularly in a small nation where people get around and know each other, you have networks like Partners in Health, for example, and medical systems where people actually see what the scientific and medical community are doing. So that gets to your point about communication. And I think we all have to make sure we, we have that two-way dialogue that's so important. But the big, uh, the big danger to me, and I think it's applicable to vaccines, but I think it's applicable to all of what we're doing in, in science and in medicine, is disinformation. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest threat I see is that there's so much noise out there you know, on the internet that we're losing our ability to connect uh, and to deliver the truth. What we actually need is a vaccine against disinformation. That would be the best thing for vaccines. <laughs> work on but, that. Uh, but I think that's something we really have to work on. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I, I think often we look upon you know, what should be the priorities for science as an either or, and I, I think the best is to have an and, a portfolio of things that on one hand reflect the, the biggest urgency defined maybe by the public, and some others reflect investments in big ideas that cannot be de determined by constraint of today's thoughts and has to be, you know, having a special way of selecting them, maybe right. the brightest minds to work on the biggest ideas. And that would allow both to satisfy the demands of um, the public. You know, we didn't speak here, but, uh, you know, Alzheimer and mental health is even a bigger problem. Yeah. It's probably, um, you know, next to obesity, diabetes, one of the largest uh, challenges in such society. And in mental health, very little resources are put there. It's difficult science, doesn't lead to great publications, so that would be one example where there's disconnect between public needs and where scientists may choose. Tracy, do you want to quickly comment? No, I mean, I, I completely agree. Um, Darn. This diversity <laughs> by design, and it's an, a yes and, it's mm -hmm. not an either or. But I want to pick up on what Gary said around the 
misinformation in this connected world. I mean, a cultural trend that is not gonna go away is this trend of distributed trust where because of the connected world, people are looking to each other as the quintessential authoritative exactly. source. Exactly. So I think the question for all of us is, how do we play in that game? Because it's not gonna change. So how do we actually take advantage of that cultural trend and kind of flip it to be a positive mm -hmm. and not a negative. I'm going to take your last question. Don't, don't let him. Oh. He has have tough questions. Her no, part oh. is don't let him. <laughs> really, well, We're really finished fast. now. We don't have time. Sorry. It's my, it's my brother-in-law. Don't yeah, let yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, her part is Cornell and Columbia. Uh, I remember George Brown, who was head of the science committee in the Congress, who said sure. to us, the health professions community, mm -hmm. when are you guys going to learn to stop using terms that are totally incomprehensible. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, what Tracy said, we've got to not just educate the community, we've got to have the community educate us mm -hmm. in terms of how they understand the disease so that we can be more informative to them. And that would include the elimination of abbreviations and technological terms who are only, only known to the mother and father of the uh, speaker. Herbert, thank you very, very much. I'm just going to say as we, we wrap up, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you for that. Um, that uh, what a pleasure it was to have a conversation. I wish we had another hour. I mean, I'm so sorry that you guys are going to have another panel that you know, isn't this proud. But, but it, it, this is a, uh, no, I'm joking. But, but I, I really think you know, what's interesting is when we set up this panel, and we originally, when we got on the phone talking about CRISPR, talking about data, talking about tech, how quickly when it came from thinking about then, now, and imagine, that imagine became discussing the social contract of this ecosystem, discussing, you know, meeting people. You know, the strategic game of what matters may not always be, you know, the next tech leap. It may be other dimensions of that, of that uh, society. So I feel like, you know, we did something here that was unusual. And so I want to thank you very much, David Scorton. Thank you, Tracy Brown. Uh, Michael Dolston, I know you as Michael now, yeah, Michael Dolston, uh, and Mike Gary's, Gary Noble, uh, and, and uh, Gary Gibbons. Thank you so much, Thank all you. of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Gary Nabel. <laughs> <laughs>